I invite you to remain standing and join me as together we affirm our faith by speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Friends, as we gather for worship this morning, I remind you that part of our commitment as a worshiping community, as the body of Christ, is to pray for one another. And so we know that there are concerns in your hearts that have yet to be lifted up, and we also want to share some of those that have been lifted up. I invite you to pray for uh, Brian and Mildred Savory as they travel uh, to Florida as Brian's mother approaches the end of her earthly journey. Keep them in your prayers this week. Friends, let's pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks this morning. We're grateful, oh God, for the community around us. We're grateful for the signs of beauty, for the signs of your creation, which we encounter every day. We're grateful, oh Lord, for this church, for the support that it provides, for the comfort that it brings for the grace that it shares and the gospel that it proclaims. We're grateful, O oh Lord, even for the rain this morning, a rain that quenches the thirst of the land and washes it just as your love quenches our thirst and your grace washes us. And so, God, we confess this morning. We confess our longing for that which belongs to our neighbor. We confess our desire to advance our own cause rather than your cause. And we pray for healing. We pray, oh God, that you would heal our broken hearts, that you would reorient our desires toward you. Clean our hearts, O oh Lord, and make us pure. Give us the strength to pursue peace and not war with our neighbors. Soften our hearts that we might be gentle and willing to yield to your will. Oh God, help us to know the joy of a harvest of righteousness that's born out of your peace. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting this morning, for those who are ill, for those who have arrived at the end of their journey. And we pray that you would embrace them in your love. Empower us, O oh God, at the same time to be vehicles of your comfort and vehicles of your peace in a world that's desperate for us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Amen, indeed. Friends, part of the gift of the Word of God, part of the gift of the gospel is that it invites us to respond. It invites us to respond with our whole lives. And we invite you to consider what your response will be even now. And as you reflect on that, I want to share two things with you. Next Sunday, we'll have representatives from Wellroot at our church. We're going to take up a special offering for their ministry. I know it's touched a lot of you and has played a big role in the history of our church. We want you to know that opportunity is coming up next week. I also wanted to share that this week, uh, after the explosion in the apartment complex here in Dunwoody, the principal of one of our elementary schools reached out to our children's ministry and said, hey, we've got some families who were impacted by this. Can you help? You know what the answer was? Of course. Of course we can help. And so we did. And that was empowered by your generosity, by God's grace working through you. It's important for you to hear those kinds of stories, that when we bring our whole selves to the table, the lives of the people in our community are impacted for the good. Let's continue in worship.
you may be seated. And now I know why the fire alarm went off. Our music is on fire today. <clears throat> Some of you have sent loved ones into glory in recent days, and that was a beautiful piece to help us to know that they are glory bound. Glory bound. And the calling to each of us is to be an instrument of peace. But the fire alarm didn't go off while you were singing. The fire went off, alarm went off while Matt was teaching. Matt was teaching in the uh, chapel. He was teaching take two, a deeper look at the scriptures in the chapel. It could be that there are a lot of things on fire around here. It could have been that when we were gathering with David Melton, whose birthday is today. Do you see David here anywhere? It could have been all the candles on the cake that we had in Discover UMC as we celebrated new members coming into the life of our church and we celebrated David's birthday and ministry. There are a lot of reasons that things could be on fire here and I'm glad that you decided to stay and not take that as a chance to leave because as one of my good friends says, it's not a party until the fire department shows up. He was born in Humble, Texas. I would have said Humble, Texas, but I, some of the Texans here reminded me that it's not Humble, Texas, even though it's spelled that way, but the Texans here would say Humble, Texas. But he did pronounce both H's in his name. He had some wonderful earthly wisdom that I'd like to share with you. Well, maybe it wasn't that wonderful. He thought it was wonderful. He said things like this. Play off everyone against each other so you have more avenues of action open to you. Or never make a decision. Let someone else make it. And then if it turns out to be wrong, you can disclaim it. Earthly wisdom and then finally, he said this, I intend to be the greatest golfer in the world. He played to a two handicap, the finest film producer in Hollywood. He won an Academy Award, the greatest pilot in the world. That's Sid Linton. I, 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 I already know the greatest pilot in the world, so it couldn't have been this fella. And the richest man in the world. He was once quoted as saying, I'm not a paranoid, eccentric millionaire, expletive deleted. I'm a paranoid, eccentric billionaire. Howard Hughes was full of earthly wisdom that he was glad to share over and over again. But although he accomplished much, we know him more as a eccentric someone who spent a great deal of time by himself a recluse James is concerned today that you don't build a community of faith with earthly wisdom you build a community of faith with wisdom from above with wisdom that comes down from above and James continues to share challenging words of wisdom with us so I invite you to turn with me to the third chapter of James some more simple lessons that are difficult to deal with and difficult to follow. I read to you from the message today. It's James's words are... Reverend Phil, excuse me, one second. Just, I noticed you could use a Bible. I know that one, I'm sure, is nicer, but this one's better. I'm junior, by the way. I'm new here. I clearly sat in the wrong spot. Anyways, um, I figured you could use my Bible instead, and... Well, thank you, Junior. That's very kind of you. So I'm new to town. I've got a uh, new parking lot cleaning business that I threw a little uh, flyer in there for you. Thank you, I Junior. your parking lots look just a hair uh, dirty, and so I figured I'd offer up my services to you. And uh, also to anybody else here as well, I've got a great parking lot cleaning service. If you guys need it, I'm here. Junior, yes, Junior, mm -hmm. um, I think you misunderstood. There is a play going on in the fellowship hall right. called Dearly Departed. And you're supposed to be in that, not in the worship service. This is not the fellowship hall. This is not the fellowship hall. Oh. Well, then, let me get out of your hair. Uh, but on the way out, I figured I could, you know, 
give some people some pamphlets for my, for my new company here. But and, thank you're, you. and you're going to be in a play here, is that right? Yes, sir. Fellowship Hall, first weekend of October. First weekend of, of October, yes, and the sir. name of the play is? Dearly Departed. I hope you'll do that. Right now. Be Dearly Departed. I got you, sir. Thank you. Here we go. Just come on, see the show. It's a great time. It's a great time, everybody. It's a lot of fun. Bring your friends. Bring your family. It is good to be a part of a church that's on fire in so many ways. We're thankful for Junior, and I hope that you'll come and be a part of Dearly Departed in the days ahead and his earthly wisdom. Now we need some heavenly wisdom, do we not? Hear these words from the book of James again. Do you want to be counted wise to build up a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish conniving. Whenever you're looking to look better, whenever you're trying to look better than others or to get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Why do you think all these appalling wars, and where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what is yours and you risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're spoiled children, each wanting your own way. And now verse 7, so let God work his will in you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. This is the good news according to James. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to hear your word and at times it's a challenging word. It seems so simple, but difficult for us to hear that we are spoiled children, that we get in our own ways, that we get in your way, and sometimes we overreact. Help us to act and not to overreact. Help us to live out of your heavenly wisdom and not out of the earthly wisdom that we sometimes cling to so tightly. Hear the prayers of your people this day as we seek to learn your wisdom from James. In your blessed name we pray and gather. Amen. Today is not the easiest day for me. Our youngest son, Paul, has been living with us for the last 15 months. And he has just moved and started a new life in Seattle today without me. He is my child. His email address is refill. He's my child. His mother has taken him out there because he and I are probably too much alike. And she has had three vaccinations and she's going into an area that has just upped the ante on some of the restrictions that they have there. And Paul's never been to Seattle before. He got into the University of Washington. He's going to get a master's in civil engineering. And this is what we raised him for, right? We raised him to the point where you could push him out of the nest and he would do this. But Seattle feels like a long way away. 
As I said, he's always been my child, but he roots for his mother's native sports teams in basketball and football, the Pelicans and the Saints. He made a mistake, though, and decided to root for my hapless Pittsburgh Pirates as his baseball team. Libby, would you stand and show your, your shirt there today? Would you? She, there we go. There we go. We got him a shirt all the time. Every year we would get him a new shirt. His birthday was in March, and we would get him a new shirt with his favorite Pittsburgh Pirate, only to have that player be traded that year to another team. It worked like clockwork. You got him a shirt, that person was traded. You got him a shirt, that person was traded. Finally, we did what Libby did, is we went and got the right shirt. We got a shirt with the number 21 on the back. Roberto Clemente, the great one. A retired number, so he could never be traded away. My wife even made cookies for Paul, to, as he was such a pirate fan. And he says, Dad, it's taught me lessons in futility. It's taught me lessons in futility because for the first 19 years of his life, the Pirates lost every season. They didn't have a winning record for 19 years of his life. And he said, that's why I'm going to Seattle, Dad. I can root for another terrible ball team. It's good to have a son like that who keeps you somewhat humble. Roberto Clemente has always been my hero. That number 21 echoes in my life in more ways than I can count. He was, in my opinion, the best right fielder of all time. Now, some of you may say, Babe Ruth, who are you? Babe Ruth, I see that one out there. Some of you may say, Hank Aaron, a couple of y'all, but Clemente's wins above replacement from right field are 12.2, not that I know those statistics, 12.2 wins above replacement, higher than any other right fielder in Major League history, and he got his 3,000th hit, and he played two years less than Babe Ruth and four years left than Henry Aaron. He had a cannon of an arm. Vince Scully once said that He could field the ball in New York and throw somebody out in Pennsylvania. (laughs) That arm that he developed as he cut sugarcane in his native Puerto Rico. He was originally drafted, as you might remember, by the Dodgers. But the Dodgers didn't protect him in the Rule 5 draft. And because they didn't protect him in the Rule 5 draft, he was available for an enterprising Methodist to pick and steal away from the Dodgers. That enterprising Methodist name was Branch Rickey Jr. Branch Rickey Jr. had also given another young man his start. He gave another person a chance. And it not only changed baseball, but it changed the way that we see the world. And his name was Jackie Robinson, a dedicated United Methodist, using the power that he had to be able to change the fabric of baseball and to be able to change the fabric of the world. He gave a chance to Jackie Robinson. He gave a chance to this young Latino ball player, Roberto Clemente, and as Pittsburgh fans are sure to know, the rest is history. He took us to the World Series in 1960. Anybody old enough to remember that? 71, 79, uh, no, not 79. He didn't make it to 79, but he was there in 1971, and I became a Clemente fan, watching him play right field better than anyone else. He was famous for the basket catch, and I would throw the ball up on our roof and let it come down off the roof and catch it with my own basket catch. I would stand out there in right field where my little league coach had put me, and I was proud because that's where Clemente played, not realizing right field is not a compliment to a little leaguer not a compliment to my abilities, but I sat out there. The ball never came to me, but I would be Clemente if the ball was ever hit to right field. In 1969, 
The pirates built Pirate City down in Bradenton. It's where they still practice and have minor league uh, games today. They do their spring training down there. And everyone else who was in the majors at the time wouldn't stay at Pirate City. The accommodations were inadequate. The food was horrible, but not Clemente. The star of the whole team, Roberto Clemente, stayed at Pirate City. And one enterprising reporter asked him, why do you stay at Pirate City when none of the other major leaguers stay there? And he just shrugged his shoulders. But you could find him there many an evening holding court and sharing his wisdom with all of the young Latino players. He would teach them how to read from the menu, teach them how to order simple things off a menu in English that was foreign to them. He would teach them how to communicate with the other ball players. He didn't have anyone to do that for him when he came up in 1955. So he selflessly invested in other players and shared with them a great deal of wisdom, like this piece of wisdom that echoes in my memory from Roberto Clemente. He said this, Anytime you have an opportunity to make a difference in the world and you don't, you are wasting your time on earth. Anytime you have to make a difference in the world, if you want to join Rich here at the High Tower Homework Club, raise your hand, right? That he'd be glad to have you come with him and help him, right? Uh, it's part of what he does. Anytime you see an opportunity to make a difference in the world and you don't, Clemente told them, you are wasting your time here on earth earth. The writer of the book of James, which I, 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 I just have to believe Clemente read James and lived James. For him, it was not just enough to say things of wisdom. He was a person who lived out wisdom. For James said, faith without works is dead. I think he would have also said, wisdom without action is deadly. Wisdom without action is deadly. And James was calling all of us to build community by the way that we interact. He said, why are we always at each other's throats? It's because we want something that we don't have. We find ourselves at each other's throats. Robert Fulgham illustrated that beautifully by telling about teaching a high school philosophy class. He said he used to teach a high school philosophy class, and when he would teach that high school philosophy class, Chris, his first day, every time in this philosophy class, he would have everybody gather in the room, and he'd say, you're going to start by playing musical chairs. No high school student would ever say, how do we do that or what are the rules? They would just line up the chairs and gather around them in a circle waiting for the music to start. And the music would start and then Fulgham would pull away a couple chairs and then he would stop the music and they would rush and try to find a seat and they would fight for a seat. And he said every time he did this you could see their faces the first time they played this game. These are kids who played it back in second grade, and they should have known the rules, but those two kids who didn't get a seat the first time had that, like, how dumb can I be look on their faces, and they just kind of slunk over and stood along the wall, angry and dejected, watching the rest of them play. Fulgham takes away two more seats, and they continue to march around, and as they march around, the game gets more and more serious. They push and they shove trying to get their seat wanting to have a seat for themselves and you get more and more angry people and more and more disenfranchised folks moving over to the wall and just watching the debacle that is happening there in the middle of their high school classroom pretty soon you know it gets down to two wrestlers they're two wrestlers and they're willing to do whatever it takes to win this game. They will bite, they will cheat, they will kick, they will punch. Anything they need to do to get that last chair. And when the music stops, one of them pushes the other out of the way and claims the chair and victory for himself. And he sits there so proud of himself saying, I'm number one, look at me, I'm number one. Looking for the admiration of those along the wall. And is that what he gets from those along the wall? No, hardly. He gets contempt. He gets resentment. None of them want to have anything to do with him, and none of them want to have anything to do with this game. 
this game that has immediately gone from something supposedly fun to something that becomes quite serious. And isn't that how high school works? It looks like it should be fun, but it gets pretty serious pretty quickly. And isn't that how the rest of our lives seem to work? You think things are going to be fun and somehow it gets pretty serious pretty quickly. We start to make things more about us, about a competition. And this is what James is saying. James is trying to remind us that if we are going to build community, we sometimes have to put what, is, what we want to be secondary. Fulgham says, now we're going to play again. And a couple of the athletes are like, yeah, I got it this time. I'm going to play. I I want back at this. But most everybody else isn't interested until he says, we're going to play again. Everybody come back. We're going to play again. There's just one rule change. This time, when I take away chairs, you still have to find somewhere to sit. Sit on someone, sit on a chair with someone. I don't care where you sit. Just find a place to sit. There are no one going to the wall. Everybody stays in the game. And the kids are like, okay, let's see how this works. He takes away the first two chairs, and there starts to be laughter and giggling as people try to figure out whose knee they want to sit on and whose knee they don't want to sit on, who is willing to to share a chair and who's not willing to share a chair. It becomes a people puzzle, and some of the organizational kids They start thinking through, now, how are we going to do this when we get down to one chair? How are we going to all somehow pile on and sit on this one chair? They get down to one chair, and he said he's done it in all sorts of settings with a variety of ages. And he said every time he does it, they get down to one chair, and they all kind of cascade out from that one chair and try to keep their balance. And if they tumble off, they get back up again And they do it so they have the victory of all being able to be on one chair. Fulgham says it happens every time. And everybody is enjoying this new way of being except for one person. The guy who won the last time. This paradigm shift is not working for him. He thought... I'm the winner. I know how this works. I know what the rules are. What's mine is mine, and I'm the winner. And everybody else seems to be having a lot more fun with the second way of playing the game, and the ground is shifting beneath his feet. What was that? I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. Oh, whoever was sat on is the least happy. I think we can say an amen to that. Whoever was at the bottom of the pile. But Fulgham has one more trick up his sleeve. He says, we're going to play this one more round, and this time we're going to not have any chairs at all. And when the music stops, I want you to sit down, but not on the ground. And they say, it can't be done. This isn't going to work. We're not going to be able to do this. And he says, trust me, get in a circle. And they get in a circle, and he tells them to put their hands on the hips of the person in front of them. And when the music stops, he says, slowly lower that person and lower yourself back on the knees of the person behind you. And they feel like they've really accomplished something when they're all there leaning on each other. And I think that's what James is looking for. James is looking for the kind of community, the kind of community of faith that when someone doesn't have a seat, they can lean on each other. They can lean on their faith. They can find strength in each other. We read through these words, these words from the book of James. He says things like, mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. You can't tell people how wise you are or how humble you are and that work. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. When you try to look better than others or to get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throats. And then the beginning of chapter 4, he asks the question, why do these conflicts occur between you people? Why do we have these appalling wars and conflicts? Why does this happen? Do you know? 
Ask your neighbor, why do conflicts happen? Do you know? Or maybe you're having a conflict with them and don't want to ask them especially. Why do conflicts happen? And James puts it as simply and succinctly as possible. James says that conflicts happen because we want to get our own way. And the first version of musical chairs is set up for everybody trying to get their own way. But the second version of musical chairs reframes the whole problem and says, yes, there are diminishing resources, but there is a way for all of us to have something if we're just willing to share and not insist on our own way. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians reminded us that love does not insist on its own way. It is a matter of how we frame the problem. It's a matter of how we frame the situation. Jane Cox sent me a book in recent days called The Noticer, and in that there are two guys sitting on a beach eating Vienna sausages and sardines. And one looks at the other and he says, what do you think we're doing here on, on the beach? And he says, it's pretty obvious we're eating Vienna sausages and sardines in the sand. And he said, you could look at it that way, but I'd rather say we're having surf and turf with an ocean view. <laughs> it's a matter of how you frame it. It's a matter of how you see it. And the same problem with musical chairs is different depending on how you see it. And James wants us and is challenging us to be able to see things differently. He says the reason that you have conflict is because of your cravings. You want something you don't have and you're willing to kill for it. Now that's quite a leap, isn't it? You want something you don't have and are willing to kill for it. I'm not sure he's a literalist at this point, literally saying you want what you don't have but are willing to kill for it. But some of you are those true crime addicts and it does happen. You want something you don't have and I'm willing to kill for it. But I've seen others of you have a craving click a button on your computer and you kill a few trees. They're called Amazon boxes and they show up at your house. Can I get a witness? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or other people want something so badly, they want some relief and so they're willing to kill a few brain cells in order to make that happen. There are others who want something so badly, they want what they cannot have and they will say things and it will destroy a relationship, and that relationship lays slain there on the ground as we talked last week about taming the tongue. James is tough, isn't he? James is tough for us to have to deal with. So many simple lessons, slow to anger, slow to speak, quick to listen, Tame our tongues. See in everyone the image of God. Don't have, don't be two-faced. Don't be double-tongued. These seem like such simple messages from James, but so hard for us to live out. He says your cravings are what get you in trouble. And uh, as we were talking about cravings with our men's study this week, uh, somebody said, it feels like I have a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. David Melton said, I have a friend who says he's got a devil on both shoulders. To which one of our um, enterprising people said, you know, when I have a choice between two evils, I choose the one I haven't done yet. (laughs) I don't think that would be James' advice. I think James is trying to say that our cravings can escalate. Our cravings can get us in trouble. And when we insist on our own way, we begin to crowd out the way of others and we build enemies and we build resentment rather than building community and building people up. So I called the wisest person I know on this topic, Karen Drexler. And Karen Drexler uh, let me know that when you are struggling with things that can make you less than God has called you to be, you should call a halt. And I said, that works. It's what it says in the scripture passage. It says, when the devil comes, you say a loud no to the devil and he will flee to you. And God comes and you say a quiet yes to God. And she said, no, Phil, halt is an acronym. It means this, be careful when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Got it? Repeat it to someone next to you so I make sure you got it. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, or 
is when you are most vulnerable to the things that can trigger your bad behavior and allow your cravings to get the best of you. When you're hurt, when you're anxious, when you're lustful, when you're troubled, when you're hurt, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, are things that you need to take a deep breath and to call a halt and realize that you are most vulnerable at those times in your life. And I said, but what if I'm already hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, Karen? What can I do if I'm already one of those things? Uh, I don't know what time lunch is for some of you, but... (laughs) Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And she said, well, you've got to cope with those triggers. If you can't figure out how to cope with those triggers, you'll be in even worse shape. And she said, there are four Ds that will help you get along. Get a distraction. Find a distraction, something that will take your mind off that urge, that urge that is so present in your mind. Find a distraction. Sit down and read from James. That'll be a distraction, won't it? Sit down and read from James. Take a walk, take a run, turn on a podcast, read or listen to a book, play with your pets, whatever it might be. Find some distraction that will help you deal as you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. If a distraction doesn't work, try a discussion. Talk to God. That's what, that's what James is saying. He says, you have not because you ask not. Did you notice that? You have not because you ask not. You have not. Why don't you ask God? When, when, when you need something, why don't, why don't we ask? Why don't we ask God? We often take things into our own hands and we don't ask God. James is saying you have not because you ask not or you ask wrongly. You ask for something that you really just want. It's not something that you need. Distracted. A discussion. Dancing with it. This was a new one to me. When you have an urge, rather than acting on it, dance with that urge. Don't put up extra resistance to it. Just kind of live out all the feelings to the very end and dance with it for a while. Don't push back on it. You'll want to do it even more. And then finally, my favorite one was don't stop the tape. Don't stop the tape. Play the tape through to the very end. Because if you're thinking about doing something based on a craving, you often remember the good things that came last time you did it. And if you'll play the tape the whole way to the end, you might find some things on that tape you don't want to repeat. Right, Karen? Thank you, Karen, for this wisdom. This wisdom that can help all of us when we need to call a halt in the midst of our cravings. Because friends, there are two two kinds of people in this world, right? Those kind of people who crave closure. And in conclusion, (laughs) I'm taken back to the time I was eight years old. I was an eight-year-old boy, 1972, December 23rd, and we got the report that a terrible, terrible earthquake had hit Nicaragua, and Managua and other places around in Nicaragua were devastated. December 23rd, 1972. Even the cathedral clock there in the square in Managua was stuck at 1227 a.m. Roberto Clemente had just been to Nicaragua several weeks before with the Amateur World Series, and he did everything he could in his native Puerto Rico to be able to get together supplies to be able to help the people there in Nicaragua. In one week, he was able to get together $150,000. You know, ballplayers didn't make a lot of money back then. He was able to get $150,000, which uh, adjusted for inflation would be a million dollars today. He got a million dollars. He got all sorts of supplies, and he had them sent to Nicaragua for those in need. And then he got a report back that Christmas week that what he had sent was not being distributed correctly or properly. So he decided to get another plane load of supplies and head toward Nicaragua himself. So on December 31st, 1972, Roberto Clemente, the great one, 
got on a plane in his native Puerto Rico that barely took off when it crashed into the sea, killing him and everyone on the plane, and those much-needed supplies never did get to Nicaragua. I don't know if you remember it or not, but that same week when the earthquake hit Managua, Howard Hughes was there, and he immediately got on a plane and got as far away from Nicaragua as he could. Two men on the top of their game One flew away from hurt and pain to be able to follow his cravings, and one flew toward hurt and pain to be part of the saving. The choice is ours, friends. Are you going to listen to earthly wisdom or heavenly wisdom? Do you want to be part of a journey that is more selfless or more selfish? Clemente always said those words of wisdom. If I see a need and don't do anything to help, I am wasting my time here on earth. May we listen to the echo of James for ourselves today and be driven not by the cravings that are at work within us, but the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ that is at work within us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand and to join your voices in our closing hymn. And as we sing together this closing hymn, if there are those who want to join in the membership and the fellowship of this church, I invite them to come as we sing Blessed Assurance and we hear the echo of the prayer of St. Francis in our hearts and minds. May we go forth from this place as instruments of thy peace. Will you stand and lift your voices?
It has been a wonderful day of welcoming new members into the life of this church. Uh, Jay and Rebecca Parker joined at the earlier service. They're looking for a Sunday school class. So if some of you, one of you has a Sunday school class, I'm sure they would be glad to be contacted about your Sunday school class. Joan Williams comes to join with our church on behalf of herself and her husband, Ralph. We're glad to welcome you. We also have the good news that Karen Heinsen, uh, whose husband Ron passed away several months ago, she lives in at, off Ashwood Park Way in Dunwoody, and she is an attorney who works with Joy Melton. She's transferring from the Anglican Church on Johns Island, South Carolina. So you want to welcome her online. But Joan, we are so glad to have you here, you and Ralph. And I ask you, as you transfer from the Alpharetta United Methodist Church, will you live out your faith and uphold this church, the Dunwoody United Methodist Church, through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. We welcome you as the newest member of the Dunwoody United Methodist Church. I'm sorry Kay Hunt and Warren Aldrich, your partners in crime, are not here today. They're friends from over at Summerby, and uh, they hang out together usually right back there behind Owen. So I know that you want to greet her and welcome her into the life of this church. Roberto Clemente, before he left the house, every day would ask his parents for a benedicion for a benediction, for a blessing, and they would offer him a blessing. Isn't that a great thing that your child will ask you for a blessing before they leave the house? Mine didn't do that, <laughs> but I'm still praying for him every day. They offered him a blessing, and he said, he said, why is it when the reporters come, they asked me about the game that we've just played, the most important game is tomorrow's game, the, haven't, the game we haven't played yet. We all have a chance to start again, friends. We all have a chance to start with a new game tomorrow. And I invite you to go in God's mercy and God's peace to share goodness and grace where you see a need, help to meet it. Otherwise, otherwise you're wasting your time on earth. Roberto Clemente, I'm a little obsessed here. Can see that. <laughs> Roberto Clemente uh, said, God made me to be a baseball player. I was born to play baseball, but not just to play baseball, but to be able to use baseball as a way to change people's lives and a way to change the world. May you find that kind of purpose in your life in the days ahead. I hope you'll come and greet Joan and welcome her into the life of the church as she heads out with me this day and we sing of that peace that only Christ can give. Let us lift our voices together. <laughs> 